We're working our way through our doctrinal statement. Uh, it's good to review about every 50 years or so. Next year is our 50th anniversary as a congregation. The title of this sermon is, Are Sacraments Like Magic? And every church I know of uh, would answer that question, no. Uh, I don't know of any church that would say, oh, it's magic. But as they are taught, sometimes the popular conception is that they possess some magic in the observance itself or in the elements of it that will save people. Today we're going to examine the differences between sacramentalism and ordinances. The chief illustration, of course, of sacramentalism uh, in our area is the Roman Catholic Church. They're not the only ones that are sacramental in their approach to things. But uh, to deal with that or to talk about that, I'm going to use quotes from the Catechism of the Catholic Church to fairly represent their official teachings. And then we're going to look at our current statement on ordinances in our Constitution and then present our view of the command to be baptized and the commands for the observing the Lord's table, along with helping to understand their ritual meaning and significance. Now these two terms that you see on the screen are terms that we're going to contrast in the sermon. One is sacramentalism. Sacramentalism is defined as that the observance of the sacraments is necessary for salvation and participation can confer grace. In other words, you get grace by participating in these observances. The other one is the word ordinance, and that just simply says that they are rituals which Christ commanded the church to do. Now, not everybody that's Catholic is going to believe what the priests teach on every doctrine. Uh, many of you uh, are Catholic, come from a Catholic background, and you probably say, well, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe what that is. Well, that's, that's fine. I realize that's true. But uh, rather than dealing with what everybody believes, I want to deal with what the church officially teaches. And for that reason, uh, we're going to talk about uh, how this word sacrament came about, how it was used, and then we'll present some quotes directly from the catechism to explain what sacramentalism is. If you did not grow up in a Catholic church or a church where uh, for instance, communion was dealt with as a sacrament. This is probably going to be new to you. Uh, if you grew up in one of those churches, you're going to say, oh yeah, that, that's it. That was how it was. The word sacrament originally was a Latin word that meant when you had a court case with somebody else, you made a deposit. You made a sacrament. And uh, if you lost the case, you lost your sacrament. The sacrament was then taken. It was offered up in the pagan temple. It was offered up to the gods, and uh, I'm not sure why the loser had to do that. Uh, maybe because he needed more grace the next time, or he needed some special help the next time he decided to sue somebody. But uh, this Latin word sacramentum, or sacramentus, was taken over, and it was used when the Latin translation of the New Testament was made. And every place they found the word mystery, mysterion, in the Greek, they would translate as sacramentum. And so that's the development of that idea and how it crossed over into the teaching of the Catholic Church because it comes from that word sacramentum. Uh, now, in the, uh, the next slide, you're going to see in the upper left corner a blue number. And this is the section number or paragraph number from these quotes. Well, let, me, let me quote the official teaching of the Catholic Church on this. Uh, in 1076, not the year, but in, in section 1076 or paragraph 1076, it says this, The church was made manifest to the world on the day of Pentecost by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Totally agree with that. And then he says, The gift of the Spirit ushers in a new era in the dispensation of the mystery, the age of the church, during which Christ manifests, makes present, and communicates his work of salvation through the liturgy of his church until he comes. In this age of church, Christ now lives and acts in and with his church in a new way appropriate to this new age. He acts through the sacraments in what the common tradition of the East and West calls the sacramental economy. Now, if you're not familiar with East and West, uh, and I just lost the date, I think it was 1051, that the, there was a split in the Catholic Church 
And so the, what we know as the Catholic Church is the Roman side of that, the Roman Catholic part. The Eastern Church goes by the name of Orthodox, either Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. That's the Eastern Church. This is the Western Church. But they have a common tradition in regard to the sacraments because this goes back at least to 200 A.D. And uh, he acts through the sacraments in what is called the sacramental economy. That is the sacramental way, I believe he's saying there, of dealing with these things. This is the communication or dispensation of the fruits of Christ's paschal mystery. Paschal mystery has to do with his sufferings. In the celebration of the church's sacramental liturgy. Now let me go on to the next one. These, these will build. You'll come to understand what it's about as you read these. I'm going to read the whole I'm just giving you sections up on the screen. Seated at the right hand of the Father and pouring out the Holy Spirit on his body, which is the church, Christ now acts through the sacraments he instituted to communicate his grace. The sacraments are perceptible signs, that is, words and actions, accessible to our human nature. By the action of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, they make present efficaciously the grace that they signify. Now, what he's saying there, as I understand it, is that uh, they are efficacious. That is, they actually accomplish something through the elements, for instance, of the Lord's table, that the elements themselves accomplish something. I think the Catholic Church, and I, like I said, every church I know of would reject the idea that these are magical, and yet the power is connected with the object. But what he's saying there is the, uh, the grace is poured out, it's dispensed, not in the term, we use the term dispensation, but it's dispensed to people. As they participate in that, you get a little more grace. You get a little more of God's grace. But that it's God and the Holy Spirit that are actually working through this physical element or this physical action you're doing. Now, uh, the next part is something you really need to pay attention to. Uh, 1128 says this, This is the meaning of the church's affirmation that the sacraments acts, act, and I don't know Latin, but I'm going to try this, ex opere operato. But literally that means by the very act of the actions being performed. In other words, because the action is being performed, it is therefore in operation. It's working. By virtue, that is, by virtue of the saving work of Christ accomplished once for all, it follows that the sacrament is not wrought by the righteousness of either the celebrant, that is the priest, or the recipient, that is the person in the congregation, but by the power of God. From the moment that a sacrament is celebrated in accordance with the intention of the church, the power of Christ and his spirit acts in and through it, now notice, independently of the personal holiness of the minister. Nevertheless, the fruits of the sacrament also depend on the disposition of the one who receives them. In other words, the priest could be an atheist, but as long as he's been ordained as a priest and he performs the ritual the right way, it's effective, it's operational, it will do its work. It has no dependence whatsoever on him and very little, if any, on you. No dependence on you uh, you might be a person that's uh, an atheist, but you're partaking as a baptized Catholic in this, and it's going to accomplish whatever it's supposed to accomplish in you. That's the way this is sort of working. 1129 says this, The church affirms that for believers, the sacraments of the new covenant are necessary for salvation. That's key. And that's a key difference between what, the Catholic Church teaches, and many sacramental churches, although not, not all sacramental churches believe what the Catholic Church is saying here. These are necessary for salvation. They may believe there's grace imparted, but uh, many do not believe that these are necessary for salvation. Now, if these are necessary for salvation, what are they? Well, there's seven sacraments that are recognized by the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and I've just given you a list of these. Uh, baptism, confirmation, which is the laying on of hands, uh, that you are confirmed as a Catholic. Eucharist, which is our term for the Mass. Uh, it means celebration. That's one of the terms for the Lord's table is celebration, Eucharisto. Uh, confession, holy orders, ordination. The reason that's very important because you cannot have a proper observance of the elements of the sacraments without a priest. 
an ordained person or an ordained deacon. You have to have that ordination upon you for that to be effective. Otherwise, it can't be done. No, not just an ordinary person cannot take bread and wine and serve communion and it be effective. It has to be someone that's been ordained by a bishop to do that. Marriage, and then anointing the sick, which is sometimes called the last rites, but actually it's technically uh, the healing rite. So if somebody's sick, you call for people to do that. Now, in contrast to that, we say there are two ordinances. That is, two things which Christ has commanded the church to do. And uh, we say these two ordinances of the local church are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, before we look at those and what I believe the Scripture, I can show you from Scripture of their meaning, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to guide us in our study today. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we want to build our faith upon what you say, what you teach. Lord, we want to live as biblical Christians in obedience to Christ. So, Lord, we ask now that you will guide us as we study, as we look at various scriptures, as we consider the teaching of the Bible in regard to these two ordinances of the church, to baptism, water baptism, and to the observance of the Lord's table. If, Lord, you'll guide us and prepare us to be obedient disciples of yours. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. An ordinance is something that's commanded. Jesus commanded his disciples to baptize in what is commonly called the Great Commission. That's in Matthew 28, 19. And he says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, in this verse, the word make disciples, translated make disciples, is the command, it's the imperative. This is what you're to do. The word go, translated there, go, is a participle, mean as you are going, therefore make disciples of all the nations. How do you do that? By baptizing them. So there's a command to make disciples by baptizing people. But what does it mean by that? Well, when you're doing that, you're, you're being baptized, you are declaring that I am going to follow Christ. And as a person is baptized in water, they are making a statement that I believe Christ and I am going to follow him in baptism. Now, turn with me to Romans chapter 4. There's a pew Bible nearby if you don't happen to have a Bible with you. If you're following along uh, electronically and you have certain programs, it may connect you there. Page 937 in the Pew Bible, if you want to follow along there, that would be a good way to do that. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, which is the Pew Bible. And we're talking about, Paul is, is making a, a, uh, an explanation of this question. Do you have to be baptized to be, or he's not explaining that, he's explaining about circumcision. And so as he's doing that, we're considering is baptism essential for salvation? Uh, there are churches that believe that. There's the doctrine known as baptismal regeneration, which means that water gives you the new birth. Uh, the Catholic Church believes that. The Church of Christ believes that. There are some other churches that have some form of baptismal regeneration. All right, let's look at what the Bible says. He's talking about Abraham. He's trying to explain that it's not by works, it's by faith. And he says, Abraham was humanly speaker, speaking the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? Now that's the key. Don't you want to be right with God? What did he discover? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Well, what had God said to Abraham? Well, this elderly man, uh, he was in 75 years old or upwards, and uh, he had no children. His wife was not old. She was 65 or upwards, and nobody would certainly say that anybody 65 is old, right? Right, that's not old, but she's well beyond the childbearing years. And God takes him out, and he shows him the sky at night with all the stars. He said, look up here, Abraham. As these stars, so will be the number of your descendants. You won't even be able to count them. There'll be so many of your descendants. And it says right then, Abraham believed God, 
and God counted that to him for righteous. So in other words, if Abraham had died at that moment, God would have accepted him to himself because he was righteous simply and solely because he believed God. Verse 4, he goes on to say, When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. And then he gives a quote from David who talks about who was not able to do any work. He just confessed his sins and believed God, and God forgave him those sins. Now look at verse 9. Now is this blessing only for the Jews, or is it also for the uncircumcised Gentiles? You see, there was a teaching in the early church that arose that said, Gentiles cannot be saved unless they have gone through the ritual of circumcision. Unless they are circumcised after the manner of Moses... By the way, write down Acts 15. I don't think I gave you that in, your, in the uh, references. <clears throat> but write down Acts 15 as, as where this is discussed. Unless you're circumcised according to the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Let me tell you another way of saying that. Circumcision is necessary for salvation. Unless you follow this ritual of circumcision, you can't be saved. You can't progress in the Christian life. That's what they were saying. In Acts 15, the church met. And the apostles and the elders and the men of the church, and they decided, no, that's not right. Salvation is by faith, not by a ritual such as circumcision. Look at verse 11. Circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith. Well, let me read it out of the New American Standard Bible, because I don't have that in front of me. Then I'll, then I'll read it out of the New Living Translation. Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. Now let's go to the New Living Translation and read that. I think it's a little clearer. Circumcision was a sign. You see they've combined sign and seal because it's talking about the same thing. Circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. If you want to be right with God, what do you got to do? You got to put your faith in God. When you trust God, God declares you to be right. It was 17 years before Abraham was circumcised, and all 17 of those years, Abraham was right with God. Wasn't always doing right, but he was always right with God. Why? Because he believed. Circumcision later came as a sign, a seal, that this is a righteous man. Well, if there was a ritual that could be required for salvation, it would be circumcision. In fact, as we'll see later on when you study about infant baptism, that the reason people baptize infants is because they want to include them in the covenant. And the, the parallel, the example they use, is circumcision. Just as in the Old Testament, children were circumcised to include them in the covenant, so in the New Testament, they were, should be baptized to include them in the covenant. Circumcision and baptism have this connection, but no ritual is required, only faith in Christ. Why do you be baptized? Well, when you're baptized... You are receiving a sign, an action, a seal that declares this is a person who has trusted Christ as Savior. Now, we baptize by immersion. There are others that baptize by pouring or sprinkling or dipping. I guarantee you when you baptize, you're baptized by immersion, you will remember the experience. Somebody's going to take and turn you over backwards and pour you, push you under the water, and then you'll float back up. You'll come back up. It's not hard. You've got to push people down. They'll, people are buoyant. They'll come back up. You will remember the date of your baptism. You'll remember your baptism because, man, that's a pretty traumatic experience. to have. To, it will remind you that this is what happened. It is a public declaration. I am trusting Christ as my Savior. Do you have to be baptized to be saved? The real question is, are you saved when you trust Christ as Savior? If you answer that question in the affirmative, and that's Paul's answer here, you're saved the moment you trust Christ as Savior. 
Larry Moyer, who came here as an evangelist last year, has, we've talked about this often, and he said, you know, there are a lot of people who are going to get to heaven, and they've been telling people all their life, I got saved in my local Baptist church at 735 on a Friday evening when I walked forward and I took the preacher's hand. And God's going to say, you know, actually you're saved at 732 in your seat when you trusted Christ, and then you got up and took his hand. You're saved the moment you put your faith in Christ. And God does that. It is the Holy Spirit of God that regenerates you, not because you've been in the water, but because in your heart you put your trust in Christ as Savior. Everything after that is a good work that you're doing, not to get saved, but because you are right with God because you are trusting God. It is not baptism that saves us. It is faith in Christ. Now, if you don't trust Christ and you get baptized, you know what you get? Wet. That's right. That's exactly right. You get wet. You go down a wet center, you come up a wet center. You go down unrighteous before God, you come up unrighteous for God, uh, for, before God. Why? Because you haven't trusted Christ as Savior. You can look at countless examples in the New Testament, and you will see that it, throughout the New Testament, it is faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, you and your household. And then they go home, and he preaches the word to his household, and they all get baptized. You know why they all got baptized? Because they all got saved. When you trust Christ, then you follow him in baptism. Now, what is the meaning of baptism? Let me suggest some things. I think I've got five in here now, uh, but uh, maybe not that many in your bulletin. But number one, it shows that we have faith in Christ. Secondly, it indicates the beginning of discipleship. Remember in Matthew 28? is you go make disciples, what's the first thing you do? You're baptizing them. Once they've trusted Christ, they're declaring that I am now going to be his disciple. It says baptizing them and teaching them to observe all the things God commanded them, Christ commanded. I, you're saying in your baptism, I trust Christ as my Savior and I want to live the way he taught me to live. And when a person is baptized, they're declaring I'm going to be his disciple. I'm going to follow the teachings of Jesus. Now that's a lifelong process. That's going to be tough to do. I've been trying it through the years. It's tough to follow Jesus, to do exactly what he says, to live that way. It doesn't come naturally. Sin comes naturally. Living right is a lot tougher. It depends. It takes dependence on the Spirit of God. Third, it shows repentance, since it follows the preaching of John the Baptist and Jesus on that subject. Mark chapter 1, verse 4, John preached a baptism of repentance. When John got put in jail, Jesus started out preaching a baptism of repentance. What's repentance? Well, repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of action. For a Jewish person to be baptized, it's like declaring all the things I've been doing in my religion up till now, I haven't been doing right. It hasn't done a thing for me. And I want to be right before God. I may be technically observing the law according to the way it's being taught, but there's something really wrong with me. I'm not really a righteous person. It takes a lot of humility for a religious person that's been trying to follow some religion through the years, to come and say, you know, I really am not right with God. And I want to change from what I've been doing, and I want to start actually living out what God has commanded us to do. They were looking back at the law. And John and Jesus, when they came preaching, were calling people back to serving God the way God wanted to be served, to actually live out the law by the way you treat other people. So when you're baptized, you're declaring your repentance. Fourth, it is connected with the forgiveness of sins. In Acts 2.38, Peter says, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is connected with the forgiveness of sin. Can anyone object to their being baptized? Peter declares, now that they have received the Holy Spirit, just as we did. He goes on in 1 Peter 3, 21 and says this, And that water is a picture of baptism which now saves you, not by removing the dirt from your body, that's what the water does, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. How would you get that clean conscience? You put your trust in Christ. And baptism is the reminder 
It's the residual. It's the thing you do. It's the good work you do now that you're saved. You do this good work to declare, I'm trusting Christ, not me, for my salvation. I'm trusting him to make me righteous and declare me righteous before God. Fifth, it also indicates membership in the body of Christ, the church. That's Acts 2.41. And identification by faith with him. And that's from Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 to 15. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but just verse 12. For you were buried with him when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. How would you get saved? They dumped me in water. No, that's not how you got saved. You got saved because you trusted Christ. You trusted the mighty power of God to do it who raised Christ from the dead. If you got baptized and you didn't believe, you weren't saved because you didn't trust Christ. If you got baptized and you didn't trust Christ, you weren't saved because you didn't trust Christ. The secret to salvation is putting your trust in Jesus Christ, that what he did on the cross is sufficient to save you. How do you know that? Well, God did what only God could do. God raised him from the dead. And by raising Christ from the dead, God declared, I am satisfied. This sacrifice has fully paid the price for sin. And now God is able to be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 3 says, we're trusting him, and that's why we're saved. Why do we be baptized? Well, we're commanded to, to follow Christ. We follow him in water baptism, not to be saved, but because we are saved say because we're trusting him uh, what about infants well you know there's no place in the new testament where it declares that infants were or should be baptized baptism is something believers did when they trusted the lord jesus christ as savior i would contend to you an infant is in is incapable of such faith they don't understand what's happening well how did the teaching get started well it came from the Old Testament practice of circumcision of male infants to make them part of the covenant with Israel. And the reasoning was that the infants of the children, or children of believers should be included in the covenant their parents were in, not in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, the New Covenant. By the way, when you see the word testament, try to substitute the word covenant. You'll understand what's going on. The Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments, the New Covenant, Jeremiah 31, the, the righteousness of God, that God takes the responsibility of making us righteous. And so parents said, I, I want my child to be baptized because I want them included in this covenant. To justify that, they read into the New Testament the practice of infant baptism. So when it says that people were baptized with their whole household, see, they got baptized with the whole household. Whole household got, had to be infants there. Now from that, eisegesis. You know what eisegesis is? Eisegesis is where you read back into the Bible what you're looking for. By that eisegesis, well, therefore, there had to be infants there, so infant baptism is taught in the Scriptures. Therefore, every infant needs to be baptized so they can be part of the covenant. Is that what makes you part of the covenant? Abraham didn't get to be part of the covenant because he was circumcised. He got to be part of the covenant because he believed God. It's faith that makes you part of that. Although they moved the entire church away from the practice of baptizing those who believed to the practice of baptizing infants who cannot believe, and they never baptized believers. Now that illustrates how twisted things can get when we twist the scriptures to suit our ideas. We just can't do that. Now, let's move on because I'm, I have very little time and I've got a long way to go. What about the ongoing ordinance? the Lord's table. We baptize believers. Believers participate together in the Lord's table. How much more are you saved if you partake of the Lord's table? You know, it's like, now this is not maybe not a good illustration, but it's like being pregnant. You either are or you aren't. You know, so-and-so is a little bit pregnant. Well, they may have just started, but they're there. You know, that, that life, you know, we all believe and I, almost everybody in Christendom, so to speak, believes that when the life begins at conception, either there's a baby there or there's not. Well, you're either saved or you're not. You're either trusting Christ or you're not. 
Either you trusted Christ as Savior or you're not. Once you trust Christ as Savior, you put it in His hand. Isn't it a great thing to know that even if you forget God, God doesn't forget you? Because with all the modern medicines nowadays, I think we're all going to get to where we forget God. Because we forget our name. We forget the name of everybody else. But you know, that's not important because we've laid it in God's hand. We're trusting Him. God says, I know, Paul says, I know whom I believe. And I'm persuaded that He's able to keep that which I've committed to Him against that day. You see, one, that's faith. Once you put your trust, God says, I take it from here. You've got to read Jeremiah 31, the new covenant. God says, I'll take it from here. I'll put my spirit in you, and I will do it. So as we partake of the Lord's table, we recognize I'm saved. That's why I'm partaking of this. Now, it would seem obvious that this practice inches us closer to salvation. And if it does that, then maybe we ought to do it, well, maybe more often than once a month, maybe once a week, maybe even daily. In fact, if the communion bread saves you, we ought to sell it in snack crackers. You know, take it with you all the time and just be good every time you partake of it. If the, if the power is in the bread, that God's going to work in that bread, we ought to be eating that all the time. It ought to be like manna. It ought to be our daily bread. Two or three times a day, we ought to be eating that, if that's the way it is. But it's not. The New Testament talks about this ritual by many names, one of which is communion. The other is the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table. And the other is the word Eucharist, which is the giving of thanks, the giving of thanks. Uh, That comes from what Jesus did when he took the elements of the Passover meal and he gave thanks for them because that's what you did in observing the Passover meal. You gave thanks for these things. Now notice the command here in Matthew 26, 26 to 28. He commands his disciples, take, eat. That's a command. Drink. Do these things. We'll find out in remembrance of me. Now, when Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, did he mean that the bread had transformed into his physical body and that the cup had transformed into his actual blood? That's one of the key questions to decide in regard to this. Now, we contend that he was giving the symbolic significance of these two elements of the Passover meal. Remember, Jesus didn't start this out, and this just came out of nowhere. They had gathered together to observe the Passover. Uh, Back when uh, Israel was in Egypt, this is the Passover meal. Now, there are three concepts on this, and uh, I take and we take a minority position in the church on that. But let me give you the three concepts you need to understand. One, transubstantiation is one, consubstantiation is the other, and I'm calling it symbolic, which is the view that we take. Transubstantiation says that the bread and wine actually transform into the actual body and blood of Jesus. They become the very substance of his body and blood. So when in this diocese, for instance, you're able to partake of the bread... Uh, I don't believe you're able to take of the cup in this diocese. Some diocese you can, but not here. That's my understanding of it. But when you partake of that, they put that piece of bread on your tongue, that wafer. Uh, once the priest has exalted it and prayed over it, he's done the, the ritual correctly. It has actually become not bread, but it's actually the very flesh of Christ that's being placed on your tongue. That's transubstantiation. That was rejected by Martin Luther in the Lutheran Church, in particular in the uh, Reformation. And, but he did not want to totally disassociate that. He said, well, it's still bread and wine. But some way that God's presence is there with it. It's in it, around it, all through it. And so it's there with it. That's the word consubstantiation. It's with it. The substance of Christ's body is with the elements. If you go to a Lutheran church today... You have to sign a little notice that you believe that before you can partake of communion. I know that because I was, we were house-sitting some kids, and we took them to their church, and I said, I can't sign that. That wouldn't be honest, and I don't want to violate their, their beliefs and their practice. So, you know, we were the only two people on the whole row, I think in the whole church, that sat there while the row filed out and took communion. And it's kind of obvious they'd smoked out the non-Lutherans among them. Uh, but that's okay. I, you know, I want to be respectful to their thoughts and their practice. And if you've got to sign a card that says you believe that or otherwise you can't take it, I don't want to sneak in and do that. 
But that's consubstantial. We say, no, the elements merely represent for us Jesus. He's not in the bread. He's not in the cup. That's not, it hasn't actually transformed into his body. We are remembering his body. Jesus' body was still handing them stuff. It was not transformed on this occasion into his actual body. His actual body was going to the cross. Jesus and his disciples were eating this Passover meal. What God would see was the blood of the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. And in the Passover, when God... Uh, look, look, go to uh, the reference, Exodus 12, 13. I think I skipped that or somewhere in that regard. Yeah, there we go. He says, but the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign marking the houses where you're staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where the term Passover comes from. And the plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. Jesus is saying the meaning of that is now going to be fulfilled in your time. You're going to see it because it's my blood that's going to cause God to pass over you when you put your trust in me. I will pass over you. And rather than dying for our sins, we get to live because Christ died in our place. When we hold the bread, we think about what it cost Christ, how he suffered. When we hold the cup, it reminds us of the new covenant confirmed in his blood. We are remembering Christ in these elements. To miss those two great features is to entirely miss out on the significance of the Lord's table. What is the significance of the Lord's table? Let me give you several things here. Number one, it's not a way to divide the church between those who are really spiritual and those who are sinners. You find that in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 19. Instead, it is a uniter. Well, how do you unite people in Passover or in the Lord's table, in the observance of this? Well, unite them in declaring, save but for what Christ did on the cross, I wouldn't be righteous. I'll remind you of that. I do try to every month when we observe the Lord's table. As you're holding that bread, drinking that cup, you're thinking about, if it wasn't for him, I had no chance of being here. Righteous before God, remembering what Christ did. I'd have no confidence whatsoever. There's not good people and bad people, really spiritual people and unspiritual people, really holy and unholy, people that are on the right track. No, all of us at the table of the Lord come together and say, this is the only reason I'm able to be here. You see, it levels us out. It's not that you've lived a good life. It's that Christ did it. And everybody that comes to the table has to remember, that's how I got in. That's the way I stay in, and that's the way I stay right with God, because Christ did it, not me. Secondly, I don't believe there's any magical transformation of bread into Jesus' physical flesh and wine, uh, the wine into Jesus' actual blood. I don't believe that's there. Uh, We don't believe that. It's not a magical transformation that takes place because the words are said. It's still the same elements that it was. It's still the bread. It's still wine. It's not changed. Positively, it's a way to remember Jesus by investing the bread and cup with its symbolic significance. When you hold the bread, we remember that he gave his body as a substitute for us. The punishment we deserve for our sins he took upon himself, having paid the price, we're now forgiven because of him. When we hold the cup, we remember that we are no longer under the law with its priest. Rules we could not keep in our own power and separate it from God and condemn. Instead, we're under the new covenant established in his blood where Christ, where God now lives inside of us. The Holy Spirit is there making us right before God. When we observe the Lord's table, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes back. So why do we baptize and why do we observe the Lord's table? Let me give you three reasons, and we're closing with this. Number one, we do it because Christ commanded us to, and that ought to be enough. If Jesus said do it, we ought to do it. Isn't that what Mary said to the servants at the wedding of Cana? We got through all of that. What did she say? Those immortal words, whatever he tells you, what did he say? Do it. Whatever he tells you, do it. Jesus said be baptized. Go baptize. 
And Jesus said, remember me in the elements of communion. That's what we do. We don't stretch these two practices so far that we make trust in Jesus merely an adjunct to the observance of the ritual. Instead, through the rituals, we are caused to remember. When you have the, the privilege of being baptized or you have the privilege of seeing somebody else baptized, it reminds you, it takes you back to that time real close probably for most of us when you got saved and very soon after that you got baptized. And you remember that faith in Christ. You remember where you started from. You remember that I began by faith. I continue by faith. When you hold the elements, it takes you back. It reminds you, it forces us to go back. This is why I'm in the church. This is why I'm here. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm here simply because Christ died for sinners, and that was me. And then finally, every time we observe the Lord's table, Every time we baptize somebody, we proclaim Jesus crucified and risen as the only hope of salvation available to all who trust in him. Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? His death paid for your sin. It's done. That's why he said on the cross, it is finished. It's done. And When you put your trust in him, God who testified to us of Jesus' death and his sufficiency by raising him from the dead, says, okay, I got it. I'll take care of everything else. All you got to do is trust me. I'll give you the new life. I'll declare you to be a child. I'll give you the right to call yourself a child of God. I'll take care of you. Even if you forget my name, don't worry about it. I've got it. And that's faith in Christ. Have you done that? Has there come some time in your life where you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? I wasn't sure about it. I went forward at a very young age, and they gave me a verse on assurance. I didn't go forward to get a verse on assurance that I was saved. I went forward to find out how do you get saved. A year or so later, because we didn't have a baptistry, you had to go to the river, so you had to wait. In Virginia, you had to wait till it was warm enough to go to the river so you could survive your baptism, uh, which was a really important feature. Uh, so I got baptized. All the time, I knew I wasn't saved. Now, I didn't know what saved was. I couldn't tell you what saved was. I just knew that whatever happened to those people hadn't happened to me. But I'd been baptized. I'd gone forward. I'd been baptized. Uh, but I, I knew I wasn't saved. And I got to thinking on my bed one day. You know, you had to take naps when you're younger. Well, you don't have to take naps, but you've got to be quiet. Because I found out later, Mom's taking a nap, and she needs some quiet. Uh, I was about nine years old, and I was trying to think, how am I going to get to heaven? And I thought, oh. I know what. We're Protestants. And there's Catholics. I never met a Catholic. I didn't know where a Catholic church was in my town. Uh, but I knew there were Catholics and there Protestants. I said, oh, okay, I know what it is. I'll do both. I'll cover all the bases. And by doing everything, I mean, you do this, everything the Protestants tell you to do, and everything the Catholics do, somewhere in there, it's got to be in there. And that's when a thought struck me. I had never thought this before. It had never come across to me before. It was a totally new thought. No, that wouldn't be trust in Christ alone. Now, I'm sure I'd heard that because my church was very faithful to preach that. It just had never clicked in the, my cabeza and never gotten through. All of a sudden, I realized I knew what I needed to do to be saved. But I don't know, did I trust Christ at that moment or not? So I kept wondering, am I saved? Am I not saved? I mean, did I trust Christ or did I not trust Christ? And uh, so one time at camp, I was about 12 years old, the evangelist was preaching and he said, you know, if you've never made sure of your salvation, you've never told God that you're trusting him, why don't you drive a stake right now? At least from this moment on, you know you're trusting Christ as Savior and you've told him about that. And I thought, that sounds good. So right there in my seat, I told God I was trusting Jesus Christ and him alone as my Savior. From that moment on, I knew I had done what God said. Now, did I get saved when I was 12? I don't think so. I think I'm going to find out when I get to heaven that I actually was saved at age 9 or maybe age 10. Somewhere in the, in the process between 9 and 12, I started trusting Christ. I wasn't born trusting Christ. And somewhere in that process, I put my trust in Christ. But it was telling him that that sealed it in my mind. I've done 
what the Bible says you need to do. Maybe that's what you need to do today as we close. Maybe you just need to tell God, I don't know if I've ever told you this before, but I'm trusting Jesus Christ as my Savior. I believe what you said, that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm going to give you a moment as we pray. Let's close by prayer. Give you a moment right now to tell God that. You've never done it before. You've never been sure about your salvation. I want to just nail it down. Say, God, from this moment on, I know I'm trusting Christ as my Savior. And I want you to know that, that I'm depending upon you. I'm believing what you said. Father, I thank you so much that it's not dependent upon me to save myself. Lord, I walked that aisle so early when I was a little kid not even able to read. And I was trying desperately to figure out how to be saved, how to get to know you. Lord, I wasn't a great sinner, but there was a great sin within me. Father, I could not have lived and done enough in my life to be saved. None of us could. And Lord, I'm so thankful it doesn't depend on me observing this ritual or that ritual or giving this money or that money or doing this good deed or that good work. But Lord, it's entirely dependent upon you that the power might be yours. And Father, I believe that you give us salvation simply and solely because we trust you as Savior. And that way all the glory and all the honor belongs to you. I pray, O oh Lord, that if there's people here today that are still questioning, still wondering, Lord, they will bow before you as a sinner and declare that they cannot save themselves. They're not good enough. They need a Savior, and they're trusting Christ as Savior. That, Father, we might go forth from this place, humble, to point other people not to our church, not to our rituals, but to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, thank you for this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.